and landlords doing the evicting. Uh, in America, eviction is quite common, and I'll explain to you why that is in just a second. But I uh, wrote a book that's based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is a city in the middle of the United States of America. It's our 30th biggest city. And, um, and try to use these experiences to understand the link between housing and poverty today. And so I met a woman named Arlene. Uh, she had two boys. One was 14, one was six. And one day her 14-year-old was just throwing snowballs at passing cars. And he smacked this one car and it ground to a stop. And uh, this man jumped out, chased, the, chased the, the boy inside, and kicked the door down, kicked the door in. And thank God he left before anything else happened, but when Arlene's landlord found out about that, she decided to evict uh, Arlene and her boys for damaging property. And so Arlene took her two kids to Salvation Army homeless shelter, and then she was on the hunt for another place to live. And she found a very rundown place on 19th Street, and there was no water, actually, in the apartment, and her son had a bucket out that was in the toilet, but, you know, she told uh, me, you know, it was $525 for a whole house. You know, it was quiet. We've done surveys and statistical work that shows that families who get evicted move into much worse housing than they've lived in before. So if we want to know why some kids live with lead, lead paint and exposed wires, one reason is their families are forced to accept those kinds of conditions in the harried aftermath of eviction. So Arlene moved out of that place as fast as she could. She found a two-bedroom bottom unit duplex on a street called Atkinson Avenue. But she soon learned it was a haven for drug dealers. In fact, the whole block was really drug-soaked and hot and dangerous. And she feared for her boys. And so why she moved, the fact that she was kicked out of a place, was really important for understanding why she ended up in such a bad neighborhood. And we tested that statistically as well. And we found that families that get evicted move from poor neighborhoods to even poorer ones. Eviction seems to push families deeper into disadvantage. So Arlene moved out of that place when she found a two-bedroom bottom unit duplex on 13th Street in Keefe. There's a big old hole in the window. The carpet was filthy and ground in. And, um, but she put on a good face. She hung up curtains and she took a piece of cloth she stuffed in that hole in the window. So the rent for that kind of place, which was located in a very poor neighborhood in Milwaukee, was $550 a month, utilities not included, which consumed 88% of Arlene's welfare check. And she knew that some months she would have to sell her food stamps to make rent and her and the kids would get by on like, uh, in America, we have these things called oodles and noodles. It's like very cheap food, like ramen. So this is the situation. Arlene is not alone in spending the vast majority of her income on housing. For about 100 years in America, there's been a consensus that we should spend 30% of our income on rent. But that is no longer the case. So today, the percentage of poor renting families in America hitting that standard of affordability has declined over the last 20 years. But the percent who are incredibly rent burdened has skyrocketed to the point that today the majority of poor renting American families spend at least half of their income on housing costs. And about one in four of those families spend about 70% of their income just on rent and utilities. Why? So for the past 40 years in America, incomes have been very flat for Americans of modest means. In some parts of the country, they fall in real terms. But housing costs have soared. They've soared all around America in the coastal cities like New York and San Francisco, but in the uh, middle of the country, in the south of the country too. Between 1995 and today, median rent adjusting for inflation has increased by over 70% in America. So you have this closing gap between what families are bringing in and what they have to pay for basic shelter needs. And then we might ask, well, where's the government here? Where's public housing? And the answer is it's there, but it's only for the lucky minority of poor renting families today. Only 6% of poor renting American families live in public housing. The remaining 19% receive some other kind, kind of help from the government, usually in the form of a voucher that reduces their rent. But the vast majority of the remaining 74% receive nothing. Um, Arlene gave up looking for housing assistance a long time ago, but one day she stopped by the housing authority and asked about the list. And she was told by the, house, you know, the person behind the counter, like, the list is frozen. Because on it were like 3,500 families who had applied for rent assistance five years ago. Which isn't bad. Like, the waiting list for public housing in America's biggest cities is no longer counted in years. It's counted in decades. So I have two young kids now. If I applied for public housing today in my capital in Washington, D.C., I'd be a grandfather by the time my application came up for review. That's the situation facing most American poor families today. So Arlene fell behind in rent after she paid some money for a funeral. She got taken to eviction court, and a judge ordered to be, her to be out in early January. So Milwaukee's a city of about 104,000 uh, renter homes. Every year in Milwaukee, landlords evict 
16,000 people, that's 40 people a day, evicted in Milwaukee. Let me just tell you how eviction works in America. In most cities in America, if you are uh, a day late and a penny short, a landlord can file an eviction on you and take you to court. You have no legal representation in civil court in America, so most folks don't even show up. I have a PhD. I wouldn't show up if I had to face off with a landlord's attorney, and most folks don't. So 70% of folks that get summoned to eviction court in America don't show up. Uh, in court, you often receive a default eviction judgment, or you lose, unless you have like an amazing case. And when that happens, uh, the landlord can file something called a writ of restitution, in which uh, the sheriff can come and throw all your stuff on the, uh, on the sidewalk and literally physically remove a family uh, from their home. That happens to 40 people a day in Milwaukee, 60 people a day in New York City uh, face evictions. Um, We've now created the first ever national database of eviction in America, and we learned that last year 2.3 million people uh, were living in a home that received an eviction judgment, 2.3 million. How do we even get our hands around that number? So that's twice the number of people that get arrested for drug crimes in America. Last year we heard a lot about the opioid crisis in America. There were 63,000 overdose deaths, which means for every tragic overdose, there were 36 people put out of their homes in America last year. This is a problem of incredible scope. Whose problem is it? So if you go to most America's housing courts, you just see a bunch of moms with kids. That's the face of our evi eviction epidemic. Uh, until recently, the South Bronx in New York City had a daycare inside of it because there were so many kids coming through its doors. And low-income African-American women like Arlene and moms in particular are evicted at really high rates. So in Milwaukee, among renters, one in five uh, black women reports being evicted sometime in her life compared to one in 15 white women which is st stunning and disturbing and should very much concern us because that means that African-American women are facing the brunt of the eviction crisis. It's also not just a crisis that's in low-income communities of color. It's in white communities. It's in immigrant communities in America. One in five of all American renters now spends half of their income on housing costs. So after Arlene was kicked out of eviction court, she looked at 90 places before one landlord said yes. He had a one-bedroom apartment. Arlene liked it. Uh, she moved in with her kids and, um, and started building a new life there. And so do you guys remember what it's like to be 14? That's how old like Arlene's kid is. So it's brutal, right? It's tough. And uh, you know, Jory, he's 14 and he's experiencing these long stretches of homelessness between seventh and eighth grades. He goes to five different schools. And at his new school, he starts acting out a bit. And the uh, teacher gets mad at him, yells at him. And he gets mad back and he kicks her, kicks her in the shin, and he runs home. And the teacher called the principal and then she called the police. And when the landlord found out about that, he told her she had to leave. Kids are a big part of this story in America. They can prolong the time you're homeless after you're evicted, and they sometimes are the reason for your eviction. Uh, after that eviction, Arlene started to unravel a little bit. She told me, it's like I got a curse on me. You know, I can't sleep. We published a study that showed that moms who get evicted experience higher rates of depression two years later. It sticks with you. And between 2005 and 2010 in America, years where housing costs were soaring, evictions or suicides attributed to evictions doubled during that five-year time span. So I think the home is the center of life. And eviction deletes that. You know, it causes loss. Families lose their homes. Kids lose their schools. You often lose your community. You often lose your stuff. It takes a good amount of time and money to build a home, and eviction can delete all that. In America, an eviction comes with this mark or this blemish that can prevent families from moving into a safe neighborhood and a decent home, so we push those families deeper into the slum. Eviction causes job loss. We have studies to show this. And if any of you all have been evicted, you know why. It's such a consuming, stressful event. It can cause you to make mistakes at work, lose your footing in the labor market, and then there's the effect that eviction has on your soul, like Arlene put it once, or your mental health. So if you add all that up, I think we have to conclude that evictions, which used to be rare in America and draw crowds, they're not just a condition of poverty, they're also a cause of poverty. They're making things worse. So what should we do about this? Um, so I think that whatever our issue is, whatever issue keeps us up at night, the lack of affordable housing sits at the root of that issue. So if you care about reducing racial inequality, you have to care about the fact that most white families in America own their homes, and most black and Latino families don't because of our history of racial discrimination. 
if you care about reducing crime, then you should know that neighborhoods with more evictions have higher violent crime rates, and you can understand why, because it fractures the social fabric of a community. If you want to control health care spending, you know, the top 5% of hospital users consume 50% of the cost. Who are those folks? They're the unstably housed with severe medical conditions. So I think, like, without stable shelter, everything else falls apart. That's the bad news. The good news is the programs we have in America work pretty darn well. Like when families finally receive a housing voucher after years on the waiting list, when they finally receive this ticket that allows them to pay only 30% of their income on housing instead of 60 or 70 or 80, they do one consistent thing with their freedom money. They take it to the grocery store and they buy more food and their kids become stronger and less anemic. They work for the lucky of poor Americans that benefit from them today. But the vast majority of our families aren't so lucky and their kids literally don't get enough to eat because the rent eats first. So the affordable housing crisis can be solved in a lot of different ways, but the, bo the bottom line is we have to find a way to serve that unlucky majority in America that are getting nothing. And so the, what I advocate for in my book is a massive expansion of the voucher system, a public-private partnership, where instead of, uh, you know, if you qualified for this program, you'd actually benefit from the program instead of getting your name on the waiting list for 25 years. Mm -hmm. You could get a ticket and take it anywhere you wanted in the private rental market uh, and live, uh, live there as long as your housing wasn't too expensive or too shoddy. And instead of paying most of your income to housing costs, you'd pay 30% and the voucher would cover the rest. That would fundamentally change the face of poverty in America. That would drive down homelessness, make family evictions rare again, so in America, two questions always come up about this kind of pro pro program. One, would that be a disincentive to work? There's very little evidence of that. And actually, like the status quo is a much bigger threat to work and self-sufficiency than any affordable housing program could be because families crushed by the high cost of housing can't afford job training or community college classes to get plugged in a, a better place in the labor market. Many can't afford to stay one place long enough just to hold down their job. And we squander so much potential and human beauty because we ask folks like Arlene to spend so much of hers trying to figure out how she's going to make rent from one month to the next. The second question that always comes up is like, how are you going to pay for that? That sounds kind of expensive. It's always funny to talk about these things in Europe where it's like, yes, you should do that. That's what we do. Um, but in America, the pay for question always comes up and it is an expensive program. And it's something that is completely within America's capacity. So America spends far, far more every year on homeowner tax subsidies, especially this thing called the mortgage interest deduction. Mm -hmm. So the year Arlene was evicted from 13th Street, for example, we spent $41 billion in America on housing assistance to the needy and $171 billion on homeowner tax subsidies, which was equivalent to the entire budgets of the Departments of Education, Veteran Affairs, the Interior, Justice, and Agriculture combined. It's a giant number. Most of that, most of that benefit goes to families with six-figure incomes. So in America, if we're going to spend the bulk of our public dollars on the rich, at least when it comes to housing, we should just be honest about that and own up to that instead of repeating this lie that the richest country on the planet can't afford to do more. If poverty persists in America, it's not for lack of resources. We lack something else. So. I think uh, what is um, really uh, amazing is that you are able to describe in a really very detailed manner all these mechanisms that lead, in some sense, to this culmination of the, of the exclusion of people through eviction. Mm -hmm. And I think you also uh, show very well that, in some sense, the, this, ev this eviction or this uh, lack of uh, access to a, to a roof, to a house, to a shelter, is in some sense the bottleneck that prevents all other policies to work. That's right. And I think that's really sort of a, a, a very, you know, sort of powerful, I would say, insight. But still, uh, I'm not totally convinced by uh, this uh, voucher. Uh, uh -huh. I think that could work for uh, poor people, but still we see in many of uh, our cities across the OECD that this is not only a, an issue for uh, poor people, but also you know, middle income, uh, lower middle income people now have a problem of uh, access to housing and uh, affordable housing. So do you think that uh, this voucher sort of policy could also be something that uh, could sort of be applied in a more sort of widespread manner or for this kind of other segments uh, in, the, in, in the population where this 
probably see these targeted policies towards poverty could not work, what kind of solutions could you put in place? One very important number just uh, is that you said that a very small amount of, uh, of housing in the US is actually social housing and you know, public housing. Right. And that's the same across the VCD. Hmm. Actually, the number in the VCD you said 6%, in the VCD is 4%. Oh, wow. So this problem, uh, given this number, uh, cannot be addressed only by the public yeah. sector. This needs also private sector that's involvement. Right. So yep. what kind of solutions yep. would see? So in America, so I teach classes on poverty and I always uh, give my students a pop quiz. I'm like, do you think that per capita welfare spending has increased or decreased in America? And they're always like, it's decreased, but it's increased. It's actually doubled since the Reagan years. But what's happened, it's been, it's been directed at the near poor, the working poor, at the expense of the non-working poor, the deeply poor. So my research and my policy pers perspective has always been on the very bottom. And what can we do about the millions of yeah. Americans that are really on the knife edge? But you're right, this isn't a, this isn't just a, a problem for uh, uh, the very poor. This is a pro and it's not just an American issue, mm -hmm. right? So in London, for example, the average home takes 30 years to the average British salary. In cities like Lagos or Seoul, Korea or Mumbai, we're seeing incredible housing shortages and stress. So this is a this is a global issue. The world has moved to cities, and cities become or unaffordable not to, to to millions now, but it, but you know uh, getting close to billions of people. So what do we do about that issue? And so I think that the things that someone like Arlene needs is very different than uh, th someone that is a, a teacher or a social worker. But it's something that uh, those folks need too. And so in America, we could think of lowering the access to home ownership for certain populations. The political economy is really tough to do that in. So in most American cities, you get your revenue by one source, property taxes. To raise the rate of property taxes, you need a conservative state legislature to approve that. So it's very hard politically. In many cities, there's exemptions. So in Boston, for example, half the city is exempt from paying property taxes because it's a university or a nonprofit. So you're the mayor of Boston, you need to fund your roads. Mm -hmm. What do you do? You kind of gentrify your city. And that makes it very hard for like, uh, a lot of middle and, and working class people to afford to live in the city anymore. Yeah. That's uh, something that we, f uh, we, we found in many, in, in many sort of places where right. this, uh, this sort of uh, incentives on local governments to collect uh, you know, taxes through, uh, through property actually prevents from, from the provision right. sort of a social housing. I think it's really now time to open to the, I th I'm sure there's a, a, a lot of questions uh, raised by this uh, really stimulating uh, sort of book and presentation. Yes? You need the micro. I put this on, I put this on right? Ah, okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you for the presentation. Doesn't it work? No? You're perfect. Rakim is perfect. making a sign. It's good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's very uh, interesting work. So, I was curious to know about the landlords that few eviction orders because um, I think we have an image of landlords being private uh, individuals but in m many Rust Belt cities there is a policy of um, a practice of speculators uh, buying houses in actions and then evicting people and even some municipalities have programs to kind of clear houses that have uh, poor landlords in or have uh, some complementary programs like a nuisance abatement programs that uh, also contribute to evictions. Right. So I was curious to know in your research, um, who are the landlords? Right. Yeah, that's we don't know. Mm. It's actually very hard to know in America. So if you look at uh, property records in America, it's a, it's a very hard to know who owns your city. So one thing that we're trying to do in my lab at Princeton is to say, who are the top evictors for every city in America? And it's a very hard question to get because many uh, landlords can shield themselves behind what's called a limited liability companies, right? And so Arlene's landlord, Sharina, she put every single property in a different limited liability company name. It's called the LLC in America. And that allowed, allowed her to have some, that allowed her to practice landlording in a very unscrupulous way. And so what she would do is she would just run her property into the ground and then when it became unprofitable, when it, the repairs became so much that it would just swamp her profits, she just literally walked away from the property. She called it giving it back to the city. The city would put it into tax foreclosure and destroy it. So the things she's doing to actually contribute to affordable housing 
on the front end actually contributes on the back end too because now we have one last house uh, that's available to families like Arlene's. And so I think one policy implication is to make it more transparent. Eco economists call this the asymmetric information problem. We know a lot about tenants, but we don't know en enough about, about landlords. I think that after the foreclosure crisis in America in 2008, there was a, something happened to the urban rental market. We need a lot more research on this, but if you just give me two minutes, I'll explain what I think happened. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, you have foreclosure crisis. And in America, the press covers that crisis by saying these homeowners got above their means. But like in LA, for example, one of two foreclosures is a rental property. Um, it's a great time to be a landlord though because the, the value of a property drops by about 27% on average, but rents do not drop, in part because there's a lot of ex-homeowners now flooding the rental market. So you can buy property for below market rent and then sell it or rent it at market rent. But there's an insolvency crisis among lending institutions, right? One landlord told me banks went from stupid to stupid. They gave out all these loans, but then they gave out no one loans. So who has the opportunity to take advantage of this great market opportunity? And the answer probably is big landlords or private equity companies, right? They have the, the capital. And, um, and so I tried to study this, and I was, it was just like impossible to actually get some empirics on this. And so, um, but then uh, a few years after this happened, we did see some write-ups in the newspaper about private equity and hedge funds coming in and buying literally blocks and blocks and blocks of foreclosed properties. And that might have some consequential effects on families getting evicted. When I went out with evictions on eviction moves in 2010, you'd go to someone and say, who's evicting you? They say, so-and-so's <laughs> evicting me. This is the story. I went out in 2014 and I'd say, why are you getting evicted? They'd be like, well, uh, I sent my rent to this place and they sent it back, say we don't own your property anymore, and I sent it to this. People don't even know who's owning their own property anymore in America. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the very simple question you asked, who's the, who are the landlords, is actually a very hard one and it, and it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. Hi. Thank you very much for, for the interesting uh, talk. Um, I was a bit puzzled at the beginning when you start talking about the issue of eviction laws and how this actually affects the uh, life of those people that are evicted. But then when we move to policy suggestions, you somehow shift away from talking about uh, eviction law and you move into uh, more social housing. So what is your, what is your point? What, do you, what is your evaluation about more or less efficient eviction laws? And the reason I'm asking this is because, in fact, in Europe, uh, there are many people, even in policy environments, suggesting that uh, bankruptcy law should be strengthened, and that, of course, would uh, you know bring to uh, more evictions. So, what is what is your view about this? Um, and uh, in terms of the second point, in terms of policies, you um, you talk about offering more social housing, but at the same time, maybe there are uh, you know there are different uh, nuances in this. Maybe instead of offering a new house for free, you can think about some some benefit or some uh, deducible to to the to the uh, to the families that cannot really afford uh, to pay a rent to decrease the actual impact of the rent on their own income. Right. So on the first question, you know, most evictions happen because people fall behind in the rent. And um, so if you survey folks in eviction court, you find that over 90% of them are there because they can't pay the rent. Most of them get no social housing or any kind of help from the government. So the fundamental or the root cause of this problem is a lack of affordable housing, and that's the root solution. Now, what do laws have to do with this? And so if you and I looked at the laws on the books in a city like Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in America, I think both of maybe, well, at least from an American standpoint, we'd say these are pretty good. Like if, you're la if your landlord uh, has some um, housing issues or something, you can withhold the rent, you can keep it. Um, but if you're someone like Arlene that's paying over 80% of your income on rent, you're going to have to ask your landlord for a favor one of those days. And so what it allows is it allows landlords to get away with bad housing conditions and it allows tenants to get housed, right? It's like a low, low. Landlords can't retaliate against a, a tenant if they turn, it, turn the landlord in for like a bad housing problem, but they can evict someone at any time for being behind in rent. Make sense? And so a lot of tenants just don't, don't call and they li because their rights literally cost money. And so if we try to regulate ourselves out of this problem in the American sense, at least as the laws on the books now, we won't be able to do it. The laws are fine. In most cities in America, 
the laws don't protect you if you're behind in rent. Mm. You know, it doesn't even matter if you're mm. living in a, um, a garage or the landlord hasn't turned on the water. Those protections aren't there for you if you're not current on the rent. And so, you know, unless we kind of address that problem, we're not going to have kind of a legal infrastructure that would help uh, tenants. What we could do, though, is we could provide tenants lawyers in housing court. And so the New York, New York City just passed the first ever right to counsel in housing court, uh, joining the rest of the world, so that, um, so that a tenant who is facing eviction will at least have a lawyer by their side in New York City. Um, there's other cities in America that are considering this, and I think that's a, move in the, a productive move in the right direction. Other questions? Yes. Thank you very much for this uh, really interesting uh, talk. I have a question regarding this, uh, the, the, the voucher program that you proposed, and in particular um, regarding the 30% the co-payment that you suggest for, for working, uh, for working uh, households. And I was wondering whether this 30% uh, co-payment uh, has some, some kind of uh, justification based on, on incentives or whether you think this is, uh, whether you propose this mostly for political reasons. Um, when we look at, at uh, countries within the OECD that have strong uh, welfare states, we see that many countries actually have a right uh, to housing in their, in their, either in their right. constitutions or in their laws. Right. And this, in, in many instances, this implies that uh, in the last instance, the state actually pays uh, the entire rent for poor families. Is this something that you think is desirable or, uh, but not feasible for political reasons, or are there other um, are there other, other reasons why you, why you proposed this 30% co-payment? Right. So um, political feasibility in America right now is an interesting question. There are things that we thought were not feasible a few years ago mm -hmm. that totally happened. And so I've begun to question kind of this idea of like what is, what is feasible or not. Like the mortgage interest deduction, right? No one had touched that thing in 100 years. And in the last tax bill that the Republicans passed, they just messed with it. You know, they, they, they touched it. They put a little cap on it. So we're like, oh, that can happen now. And so I think the 30% has been a number that's been around in America for about 100 years. This is our, our broad consensus of what affordability should be. There's some studies behind that that suggest that when families are paying that, they do have better life outcomes. Our kids have better life outcomes. So it seems like a reasonable percentage. I love that, you know, I love your question about rights. I think absolutely housing should be a right in America, and it's something that I think it is politically feasible. I think rights in resource-rich and resource-poor countries uh, really matter. So I was in uh, Brazil last summer and spending time, Brazil has a right to housing in their constitution, and was spending time with an Occupy movement that takes over abandoned uh, buildings in the middle of Sao Paulo. I have no idea why there's so many abandoned buildings in Minnesota, Paulo, but there are. And they don't, they don't march in at midnight or two in the morning, right? They go in at noon and they have a parade and they fly flags. And they say, you know, you said we had a right to housing, Brazilian state, and no one was using this place. And the Brazilian state either evicts them overnight or says, yeah, we did say that, we did. And they stay for years. And so I think that, I think rights, uh, rights really matter. And there's no way, I think, delivering a universal benefit of housing that helps all families and one that helps the unlucky majority of poor families without having some sort of rights basis to ground it in. It's interesting that actually you talk about Brazil, because in yeah. Brazil, indeed, this is a right. right. And there's this huge program, they call it uh, Minha Casa Minha Vida, My right. House, My yeah, Life. Right, yeah. But one of the problems with this, uh, with this uh, sort of um, uh, policy was that it was a bit uh, uh, fragmented. Yep. And one of the issues that we, uh, we sort of analyzed uh, with this problem of housing is that uh, the housing interacts uh, and uh, the management of land interacts with many other policies yeah. across different ministries right. in, this right. in the government, right. across levels of government, right. across uh, different sort of administrative boundaries. In a city, right. you have a lot of municipalities. In right. Paris, for example, we have uh, thousand yep. <laughs> thousands of municipalities. So uh, have you, in your field work, be confronted with this issue of coherence, right. of lack of coordination, yeah. lack of di dialogue? Yeah. For instance, even we, uh, we sort of experience that you know, the people doing special planning in cities don't talk much with people doing uh, finances, for right. example, or economies. Right. So have you, have you been sort of yeah, confronted with this issue of a yeah, lack of platform yeah. for dialogue? Yeah, daily. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, if I was a jobs guy, you know, mm. we were having a jobs conversation, 
I don't think you would ask me to solve uh, segregation or failing schools, but housing is bound up with all those problems, right? And so it confronts um, America's legacies of racial segregation and the fact that certain neighborhoods are very bad for kids and certain neighborhoods are, you know, reproductions of privilege. Um, it aligns with some schools are failing and some schools are wonderful. And what do we do about that? And I, for me, um, I, I'm of two minds about this. You know, uh, on one hand, I say we shouldn't have to choose between all these problems. We we have the means to address them all. But on the other hand, I think uh, that's very that's not very helpful to someone that's in the trenches trying to make policy on a day to day basis. So I was in Houston a few months ago with the housing commissioner, and he had money to build affordable housing. So he starts building a thousand new units in a very poor neighborhood in Houston. Um, but then our federal government, it's called HUD, it's called the uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, goes to him and says, you can't do that. That's not furthering affirming fair housing. It basically means you're segregating the city because you're building affordable housing in this poor neighborhood already. Exactly. So the commissioner says, okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to go build in this middle class neighborhood, a solid neighborhood. I can only build 350 units there. But, you know, for those 350 families, it's good. Uh, but you know what happened next, of course, the people that live in that neighborhood were like, you can't build here. We call it a, we call it a NIMBY, not in my backyard, mm -hmm. syndrome in America. And so the mayor, you can write this sentence in two ways, the mayor either caved or listened to his constituents. He shuts down the program. He gets, he gets slapped with a civil rights lawsuit from the federal government. He's an African American man. And there's no new housing in Houston, right? So it's these kind of different kind of uh, commitments that are butting up against one another. And if you asked me, would I prefer that 350 house, housing in the middle class neighborhoods or the 1,000 housing in the poor neighborhoods, I would take the 1,000 housing units. You know, people are bleeding out. And I think that that's the issue we have to care about. Um, and we have to allow neighborhoods to actually be stable neighborhoods. I think in America, we have mm -hmm. this idea that there's these stable poor neighborhoods. But it's much worse than that. Mm -hmm. You know, like in the inner city of Milwaukee, one in 14 renter homes is evicted every year. So it's just these kind of churning things that aren't real neighborhoods. And investing in stability in those neighborhoods is actually an investment not only in affordability, but investment of like neighborhood stability too, mm -hmm. and vitality. Mm. Is there other questions? Yes. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really important to speak more about this subject. Um, I'd like to build upon Apple's question that talked more about the right to housing. Uh, um, I have a previous colleague of mine who's working in Boston in at-risk housing, and one of their biggest qualms is that to be able to assist them, they give them financial assistance right. and rapid rehousing, right. but they have to be undergoing a, an eviction order. Right. And so they say that it's quite frustrating. They are able to give them financial assistance assistance similar to what you're suggesting, like in a voucher form, right. but they say it's not preventative enough because right. those people are already in vulnerable situations. Right. So um, I was thinking in terms of prevention, similar in the lines of what Apple was suggesting, that maybe we do need to rethink what people should be able to have uh, rights to in terms of housing, that maybe um, as a southerner, I understand that, <laughs> that we're going against an interesting political climate, but maybe we need to rethink what people have the rights to in terms of housing. But if you think that's not possible, what do you think we can do more in terms of prevention of uh, eviction and at-risk housing? So I think that um, you, get, you get no argument from me about the rights framework. But a part of that rights framework has to have an affordability uh, question built into it. And this is where you come to, come to questions with the private market. And, and what is affordable and why, why have rents gone up mm. so much in the 2000s? And for those of us that care about housing, many of us, I think, are, are too quick to answer that question. And we say things like, it's a supply issue. You know, we need more supply. <laughs> That's not the case in most cities in America. Most cities in America have a double-digit vacancy rate. In fact, vacancy rates went up um, along with rents in the 2000s. And so understanding like uh, the business model of things and the profit model of things and like the underlying, like I think the question of why rents have increased so much in the last 15 years is one of the most mm -hmm. profoundly unanswered questions in urban economics uh, today in, in the world. So I think that, that those kinds of questions have to abut with the rights kinds of questions too. You can give someone a right to housing, but if the housing isn't affordable, 
D does that right really deliver? And I think that goes back to the gentleman's question at the back mm -hmm. about we have certain regulations that are there to protect tenants, but if they can't afford it, then those regulations are kind of just on paper or, or only for like the more privileged um, folks. I do agree with your point that a lot of times in America we're catching people at phase you know, eight or nine instead of phase uh, one or two. And I think that that's why I think that investing in affordable housing upstream is a way to kind of uh, address these problems that we usually catch uh, downstream. In the meantime, besides you know, providing more legal assistance, we could also think about, and I know this sounds pretty radical, making Americans courts function like institutions of justice. And you know, it's, uh, if you go to an eviction court, it's, uh, it's a mess. And I remember giving a talk at Harvard Law once, and I got this question from a law professor, and I didn't understand it. I was like, what is he talking about? And I thought I was, so I thought I was just like, you know, uh, not sophisticated enough. And I, uh, this guy comes up to me afterwards, he puts his hand on me, he's like, forgive him, Matt, he's never been to an eviction court. He thinks it functions like a court, like in the movies, or like in Aristotle. Mm -hmm. But it's just like this eviction churning plant. Mm -hmm. So we could do community courts, and this is how it works. So you go into community court and they're like, uh, I see, Mr. Desmond, I see you're behind $500. Is that true? And you say yes. Now in other courts, most eviction courts, that's the end of it. That's, the, mm -hmm. that's it. But in community courts, they say, why are you behind? And you say, I relapsed or I lost my job, whatever the underlying issue is. And there's full-time social workers in the courtroom and they work with the landlord and the tenant and the judge to kind of make something a holistic benefit, which is also a benefit to the landlord. It's not like landlords get their money back when they throw a family out of their home. And so that would, that would be a fundamentally rethinking of how our court systems currently work. Hmm. Is there any? Yes. Second question. <laughs> well, I can. She's Brazilian. <laughs> yeah, just benefiting then. Uh, I have a question more about the uh, policy and the public discourse around the displacement of the poor, mm -hmm. because <coughs> I. Uh, well, we all know there's a lot of discourse about gentrification, and now I think with works like yours, we talk more about eviction. And I wonder, for example, in, in Rust Belt cities, like uh, I know Detroit a little better, so there is a lot of discourse around gentrification of Detroit, and there is less discourse if you see, like, among the African American community activists around eviction. Right. I, 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 I perceive, like, I, I was wondering if this is something you have come across in your right. research and why is that so? Right. Uh, the reason it's so, I think, is because people that um, have access to the media are people that are frequenting gentrifying neighborhoods and not incredibly poor segregated neighborhoods, typically, um, which are where most evictions happen. So if you go to this website that we just created called evictionlab.org, you can map evictions in any city in America, including Detroit, and you'll see that most evictions do not happen in gentrifying neighborhoods. They happen in ungentrifying, poor, segregated neighborhoods, where even there, families have a hard time keeping a roof over your head. So gentrification is incredibly important in a very small number of American cities, and it's a little bit of a distraction, I think, everywhere else. Now, there's this other kind of gentrification that we should think about, which is like entire cities gentrifying which is the case in London, for example, and is the case in uh, San Francisco, in New York, and there's no naturally occurring affordable housing left in these kind of cities. That city-wide gentrification, I think, should concern us. But the way we usually talk about gentrification is um, Harlem is gentrifying, U Street Quarter is gentrifying. That kind of gentrification is actually very rare and not super um, consequential when it comes to displacement. Mm. Just one final question short short question because we are really reaching the limit uh. yes uh, thank you for your talk I had a question about maybe linking it to Lorena's first question about the landlords because um, it seems that now it's quite harder to um, prevent eviction towards the lander because they are um, we don't know who they are it's often one of the reasons of the affordable housing crisis is that um, these uh, private equity firms and these really um, invisible um, actors are uh, finding in housing an asset which increases the rents for uh, poor and middle income families. So um, in this context where housing is not only uh, a residential and it's not only a home, not even a commodity, but an asset now, what do you think is the regulation uh, appropriate? Did you find in your research um, some, some sort of uh, regulation which works to prevent this, this kind of uh, rent increases? So 
one thing that my lab is doing is really trying to address this kind of who the landlords are question. And we're, trying, we're figuring out these kind of different ways of solving that very complicated data problem. So stay tuned. So, but that's one thing that we can do because what if 20, literally 20 landlords are responsible for 20% of the evictions in a city, right? So it'd mean that a very targeted approach could have a non-trivial effect on the entire city's eviction rate. So this is something that a lot of city planners are very interested in, in something that we're trying to deliver them to. In the meantime, I think everything should be on the table, everything. Think ideas that we've dismissed long ago and things that uh, we're, we're still trying. One thing that I was interested in is this question of like, how much are landlords making? Because a lot of times when you try to impose a regulation, the landlord community says, you can't do that. We're barely making it. You know? And if you give us like a new rule, then you're going to crush us. You're going to put us out of business. So we actually looked into that at a national level. And what we found is that unless you're in the hottest markets in America, your profit rates are much higher if you're a landlord in a poor neighborhood. And the reason is very simple. Your mortgage bills are lower and your property taxes are lower, but the rents you charge people are not that much lower incredibly compressed rents. And so the profit margins are not just a little higher, they are like twice as high, and that, that remains even after accounting for like 20 years of appreciation. It's enormously different. So landlords in middle class neighborhoods are really not, like they are kind of barely making it. Their margins are very small because they're like housing their capital and property and hoping it appreciates. But landlords of poor neighborhoods are playing a different kind of uh, economic game. They're in it for the now, which means we, I think we can ask more of them and they can still remain solvent and, and, um, and afford a decent rate of return. Yeah. Matthew, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, uh, this I really think this, uh, you put the finger really on a, on a critical sort of a point of uh, this uh, nexus of social policies in our countries. Housing is becoming really, as you said, a bottleneck for the social sort of policy system uh, to work. And actually in the OECD, we are get paying more and more attention to this issue of housing. I'm going to offer you also, you, you brought us a book, but I'm going to offer you. a book, a book on divided cities Great. that shows how, uh, how, how, how much in some sense we are uh, divided uh, yeah. in uh, Thank you. you know, ECD cities, all kinds of uh, sort of decisions in terms of income, access to transportation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Thank you so much. Thank I think you. you really deserve appreciate you. Thank uh, you. a huge round of applause. Thank you. That was really Thank great. You. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are we gonna go back there? So though you can go there okay. and uh, sign some books. Okay. If you okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. 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 Thank, Thank you, you so much.